Well, yeah. welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to Parallax Podcast. Hello, Alexander and Alexander. We're going to call you Elung and Bard tonight because you both have the same. same the A name. word is banned. Um, we uh, must not use the A word. I know Elung because from from a, a mailing, uh, you know, uh, a Gmail, uh, you know, a very combative Gmail uh, forum called the Intellectual Deep Web, and. Um, You've been a little quiet there recently, but 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 for a while there are some some pretty awesome uh, you could say intellectual battles going on uh, between you and Alexander and other people. So so maybe you could just introduce yourself a little bit and tell me um, you know uh, I I understand you're a Netflix you you do uh, scripts for Netflix and uh, not not for Netflix in particular. I'm writing a TV show for uh, Via Play at the moment um, about the all right TV shows yeah and. Um, and theater as well. Uh, I've just recently uh, started a new play, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm a screenwriter. Um, my background is in law and legal philosophy. Right, and a philosopher. And, um, you, you're into Whitehead and, th and things like that. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he's not discussed, discussed that much in legal philosophy, uh, but my background was in law and then I diverged from that um, after, but I am into Whitehead now a lot. Um, and Elung um, is a great composer, so he's oh, got thank you very much. massive mm. music. Yeah, I also compose. Uh, and mm. and you know, this is this is why Elung and I got along so well, and also got into really hot discussions very early on as, as soon as we met, because we're two different generations but very similar personalities when it mm. comes to this. So it's yeah. it's the thing between art and philosophy. Well, philosophy is an art form in itself, and mm. of course we're engaged in philosophy, but we also express ourselves through music and theater and other things too. So yeah. the similarities, of course, are we're hotheads, uh, but we love <laughs> can, can yeah. be. Yeah. Well, our, our That's what I like about well, you guys. Yeah. we're hotheads in this in this world. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had we had like a, a few debates in the beginning, and then we actually started to collaborate instead. Um, which I found way more productive, <laughs> of course. So, what are you, what are you, what are you collaborating on? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, that's a theme for tonight. Yeah, to be yeah. honest about it. Well, so, the metaphysics the, of the internet age was the proposed. Yeah, um, it's, it's like science. it's like the, the biggest topic you could ever think of. So, like this, this Absolutely. is the big one, right? Mm -hmm. Metaphysics is like it, it's called metaphysics for a reason. So, I mean, traditionally we think of the reality or the physical world that can be doubted these days, but we call that physics. And metaphysics, since Aristotle has has basically meant that well, the conditions for even discussing physics in the first place is what we're interested in, and that's called metaphysics. So, it's the mm -hmm. ultimate form of philosophy. That's what it is, and, and, and that's more interesting. And religion too, in in a way, no. Uh, like, what how, what? how do metaphysics and religion? Well, hmm. religion is often called a metaphysics. So, mm -hmm. religion can be a metaphysical explanation for how the world operates, or at mm -hmm. least religion has tried that. I prefer to use the word theology when I talk about mm -hmm. religious metaphysics because then we talk distinctively about how we explain the world from like the biggest possible picture, like what is the mm -hmm. ultimate end goal, or where do we originally come from, or what is the optimal mm -hmm. uh, condition of, of human life, or something like that. That's mm -hmm. what theology deals with. And I think. Theology is fantastic, by the way, and it, it's mm. having a roaring comeback these days. And as you Absolutely. and Andrew agree with too, because yeah. we, we certainly live at sort of the end times of secular modernity, and it didn't really work. And we have yeah. to figure out a new way to go. So that's where theology comes into the picture. But we can call religious metaphysics, but we just let, let's refer to that as theology. That could be okay. part okay. of the discussion tonight. But metaphysics can also be so much more. Well, we were mm. talking about this Adam Curtis uh, documentary. And how empty, like how, like it's a critique. It's always this critique of modernity. It's this. And what you said with Adam, Adam but, uh, Kirk is how it doesn't really wait, wait, give you anything. Andrew, 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 Andrew. Before you jump to that, you got to explain to the listener who Adam Curtis is. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah. Adam Curtis yeah. is a, a BBC filmmaker. He does these kind of, um, these kind of critiques of modernity with 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 montage and. Um, and weird music and found footage uh, from the BBC archives. And he puts together this very dark and tantalizing kind of filmscape. Um, yeah, and he's, and which he's is great, but the narrative yeah. itself, what he actually has to say for me uh, seems to be lacking in, maybe should, uh, maybe should in point metaphysics. Out, oh, uh, Andrew, sure. wait, wait, wait. We have to point out as well, I love you for yeah. this, uh, your ADD. Uh, <laughs> 
he's a currently discussion topic, for example, at the intellectual deep web, by the mm. way, you can all join it if you, you can all at least attempt to join it if you like. But he's a topic at the intellectual deep web because, because he just released a documentary series called Can't Get You Out of My Head yeah. that would recommend mm. listeners here to check out but because it is interesting. But, but he's like the end game in the sense that he's dealing with secular modernity like if it was the only thing you could deal with. Mm. That's out of Kirk's right. Yeah, there's there's an ending. There's like a feeling of that that world ending to me uh, somehow. Yeah, hmm. and I think the three of us all agree that he makes the terrible mistake of not including religion and spirituality in his understanding of society, because those things are very much to lie today. Hmm. That's one of the problems. But if you're going to go to metaphysics here, what Elung and I've been working on, and he's got to be very much quoted and credited in the new book I'm writing with Jan Sedekvist. We're working on this sort of big book called Process and Event, uh, which is like a narrative of all narratives. It's a, it's a major attempt to create a meta narrative, like of all the stories we humans tell about ourselves, this is the ultimate meta narrative. And in one of those, uh, we deal with what is usually called the logos, which is like, you know, the, for example, the scientific, or if you could say in a bigger picture, the metaphysical understanding of, of the world and the universe. And there might be details where Erlang and I disagree, and that's even more interesting. But I think when it comes to the bigger picture, Erlang and I have been working on a theory which is called emergence vector theory. Mm. You agree with me here, Erlang? Would you like to pass it? Yeah, absolutely. You, what well, do you mean with an emergence vector theory? Well, emergence vector theory is, uh, is a metaphysics, of course, but it's also a way to understand uh, how different uh, ontologies relate to each other. So you have been very focused on nomadology, for instance. And in nomadology, there is an instinctual drive to understand everything from the foundation of the tribe because it's so central to us. That's but what it's called nomadology. Other... We should point that out. Yeah. So nomadology is the story about the tribe itself when it's when it's mm. constantly on the move. And if, if you've got a human population that has to be on the move all the time to survive, it will have a certain narrative because of that. Absolutely. And what we what we discover um, is that almost every different vector or ontology, in some sense, have their own narrative. And what we are trying to do with the emergence theory is understand how these different systems uh, relate to each other. That's one aspect of it, of course. Um, so emergence is basically how something comes into being. And um, as, as me and Bart have um, discussed and developed, there's really no hierarchy uh, to these different vectors. They, they all, in some sense, um, are uh, the prime um, the primary vector from their perspective. So if we start with consciousness, for instance, then consciousness becomes a very like primary thing because we have to see the world through our consciousness. But if we start with physics, then physics becomes a very foundational vector because well, without physics, we can argue that there's no consciousness. Yeah, so, so we should, we should, we should add here. Vectors yeah, we should add here that, in the world. I'm just trying to understand. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Vectors, Let yeah. me start. When you do philosophy, mm -hmm. what you do yeah. with you get yourself an enemy, and nothing unites mm -hmm. two philosophers like Elon and me mm -hmm. more than having a common common mm -hmm. enemy. The common enemy here is reductionism. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And there's also reversed reductionism. So reductionism is to either say that there must be some smallest possible unit. Uh, mm. that it's more important than anything else because everything is built from the unit or everything is leading up to some kind of mm. endpoint and with human beings that's usually human consciousness or the human mind and that was the whole point and then you sort of try to go back from the human mind all the way back to the small atom and you either have to make the yes. atom something psychic like it is like a, mm. you know some something uh, like a proto consciousness or something mm -hmm. or you have to take the mm. atom all the way up and then say that oh but all our thinking and our our feelings are completely material. They can therefore like be Sam Harris would sort of say, everything comes from you know is built. He's a typical reductionist. Or, or, exactly. that, that's the reductionist. Yeah, thing. and and yeah. the problem is the opposite of that is panpsychism, and that's also problematic. Yeah, and the absolutely. only way to deal with these things is to basically say that no, no, no. The op when something occurs along the timeline, you you make time the only thing you're absolutely obsessed with. That's I think the only basic condition. Hmm. And when something occurs historically that completely changes the rules of the game, 
hmm. you get a vector out of that emergence. So that's what we call the emergence hmm. vector theory. And then, for hmm. example, biology can be described as an emergence vector. Mind is an emergence vector. Physics is another one. But you don't hmm. run into these problems, for example, the often discussed hard problem that you can't hmm. really understand mind and matter. To us, it's just two different emergence vectors. And it hmm. becomes impossible to try to describe one of the two emergence vectors with the language of the other one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because I'm basically... whole language. Came. So these you are have to understand which yeah. language game you're playing, right? These are interdependent, yeah, emergent uh, things that are happening, and they have their own language, but they're separated. But they're also yeah. Interdependent. They don't have to be interdependent. That's another point here. Mm. Yeah. So there's another term that Elung invented, which is mm -hmm. neutral monism. Uh, I think I actually subscribe to it more than Elung does these days. But neutral mm. monism is essentially this that because one, none of these emergence vectors has prim primacy over the other ones, you can discuss mm -hmm. them all independently one another, they happen to have effects on one another. As far as we know mm -hmm. from the universe that we live in today, all these different emergence vectors affect one another. When a new emergence occurs, all the previous emergence vectors are likely to be part of the game that causes that emergence to happen. Mm. So you can, leave, you can leave a lot of things out because you do emergence vector theory. But you're right, mm. Andrew, in our theory, at least when Ellen and I agree, they're all interdependent to one another and that's what we call neutral monism. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, really trying to to... why is it like... neutral monism? Um, well... because, neutral because none of them has primacy. Oh, mm. oh I so see. mind okay. is not Per so se, more as opposed to a hierarchy of important subjects. Exactly. Like we we disqualify mm -hmm. the idea that there are hierarchies between these different domains. Got it. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that's great for because you know you have these conversations with people like Eric, like the Weinstein brothers saying, "Oh, science is the ultimate understanding of the world," and other people would say it's religion, and other people would say it's fit, you know, biology, like. No, that in itself we disqualify. We're saying, uh -huh. no, the best understanding of the world is to have a proper emergence vector theory for all the different vectors. And then say uh -huh. that no, none of them has primacy. They just have different uses for us as humans, right? Okay. And we must also understand them differently. So that, that gives you a lot of other challenges you have to work with. Mm. For example, what is the law of nature? We talk about laws of nature. Well, we know law is a metaphor originally from human society. That's what's interesting because Elung is an expert in legal philosophy. Mm -hmm. And legal philosophy starts the moment we can start to write down things because mm. we can write down things. You and I can have a contract between us that we write down. So it's like a third person starts mm. acting between us and we write things in that document and we mm. stamp it with a date and then we, sort of try to think that this is forever valuable or at least it's valid for a certain period of time and we call that a law mm. and then we start looking at nature from newton onwards and we just started to discuss maybe there are laws of nature that operate mm. the same way but the mm. problem with laws of nature is that they usually seem to be assumed to exist before that nature existed itself and mm. that's when you run into problems like dualism and what we do in our work is that we're very very hard to prove that, for example, when an emergence occurs, say the birth of biology, mm -hmm. the birth of life on planet Earth, however that occurred, prior to life and existence of life and the specific laws of biology, there were certain habits. And the specific habits that existed in, say, within chemistry habits. that led yeah. up to the birth of biology, when biology happened, the habits of chemistry at that moment became the laws of biology. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have solved the problem. So the habits of science. alchemy, for example, became the chemistry or something like that. Or, or... Yeah, but the, what's important well, here is the difference between habits and laws. Habits well, exist in what we call what leads into the emergence and laws like potentials that exist afterwards. Like that. And the, in the terms we use for this is that there's an implicate order to things where the habits mm -hmm. exist, uh, which is like, what biology was within chemistry before biology existed, the sort of the protobiology of biology, the existence, the conditions that had to exist for biology mm -hmm. to suddenly occur, mm -hmm. became biology. But the moment they become, they, 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 all these things become biology and, and life forms exist and they operate in a certain manner, there's certain laws of biology that, that occur at that moment and they, they're therefore in an explicate order. Okay. to that emergence. So what about this emergence called the internet? And, and uh, since, since that was the theme. Um... Uh, well, well, actually, the question actually is, uh... I, I call that a paradigm. I don't call that an emergence. Yeah, yeah I would, huh? I would agree okay. with that. Why, why, why not? What, what's because, the beca bec because the internet doesn't have any laws that we didn't know already. The internet essentially machines, mm 
Uh-huh. These machines do zeros and ones faster and faster and then store them and process them more and more. And it connects a certain planet called Earth. And we have satellites and everything around ourselves. So the internet becomes this whole modest <clears throat> phenomena for this planet that connects 8 billion human beings and tons <clears throat> of machines and things. That is interesting stuff, but it doesn't qualify as an emergence because it's so technology. Define emergence then. It's it's emergence is a... Is a, is a um... Emergence is a domain of knowledge or emergence is a- No, 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 no. Emergence is something that happens, Andrew. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, for example, electricity existed without human beings even understanding what it was. We started taming electricity. It doesn't mean there was an emergence of electricity, but human beings started using it, but we call that a paradigm, Uh a paradigm shift. So there's a paradigm of electricity. And what we mean by that is that we've tamed electricity to human beings and can start controlling it and using it, technologically speaking. But mm. it, of course, existed in nature and within our own bodies long before that. So the birth of electricity itself could possibly be an emergence. We probably refer to that as physics and chemistry, rather. But mm. what is interesting here is that when we do emergence vector theory, which really is a way to help natural sciences operate properly, on top of that, we can then look at human history and mm. our taming of technology and the use of language, mm. so written and printed and interactive language. Yeah. And we can then discuss that at different paradigms and they have similarities. Mm. But I think it's important to understand that all these paradigms we're talking about are within the one same emergence factor that we call culture. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think one of the arguments you can make is that a paradigm doesn't necessarily need a new ontological explanation. So when we go from, let's say, materialism to mind or matter to mind, suddenly the theory of materialism in some sense stops working. So the only way to include mind in a materialist universe is to reduce it. But if we go from, through different technological, technological paradigms, we can pretty much have the same ontological explanation, whether or not it's, um, it's religious, has a religious foundation, has a materialist foundation or an idealist foundation. So what we are looking at in emergence theory is the gaps between different ontological explanations. And this is something which Nietzsche also described as perspectivism, which is basically the idea that having an opinion about uh, ontology, it's very much like cheering for your favorite football team because it's, it's more closely tied to your personality than it is to truth. Oh. And the reason why that, the reason why that is is because every ontology is lacking something. It is lacking a connection to the whole. That's the insight the whole of is modernism a... as well, isn't it? In a sense, right? Uh, this, I'm it, sorry, I, I missed perspectivism this. Perspectivism Perspectivism in the Nietzschean sense is what, what led to kind of postmodernism. Didn't it? In the yes, sense absolutely. Oh, it led to deconstruction at least. De- deconstructing, um, uh, you know, points of view and... and but, you know, perspective. Yeah, and I think the the the, um, the flaw on, on on some parts of the postmodernist movement was then not to reconstruct it afterwards. Yeah, which has led to to a, a extreme polarization in in philosophy and in science as well. So we basically we are at a point in time now where different theories of the world are almost unable to communicate with each other, and we are pretending like this is okay. So mm. what we are seeking in transcendental emergentism or emergentism is to create a common language where you can communicate between these different systems. And one, and, and, and one way to find this common language is to look at like the underlying systems that are common among them. So like there's a, a great thinker called Irvin Laszlo who's talking about systems theory. And one of his principles and I, I personally combined this with, with a Freudian association theory, is that if we look at different vectors, some of the same principles um, appear again and again and again. So like equivalency, negation, coherence, um, like the determinism, indeterminism, transdeterminism, there are all these fundamental building blocks which are narratives about the world always in, in some sense are built on. Yeah, but we should add one thing here. It is very, very tempting to think that when you start with emergence vector theory, you can find some laws that apply to every emergence and that's where people mm. start making mistakes. Mm-hmm. So people jump to the conclusion that there must be something similar between these different emergence vectors. Therefore, they, these things are conditional. And one of the create- radical things, 
Yeah, one universal of the radical theories things. of everything. Or, or... Yeah, and that's where yeah. they make mistakes because mm -hmm. then they have a crater god in the picture again, mm -hmm. right? They make the terrible mistake of going back to this point that everything is somehow mm -hmm. conditioned on some original point when it started and reductionism rears its ugly head again. That's just sloppy and okay. childish. Mm -hmm. The thing yeah. is, the thing with emergence vector theory is that you might find similarities like negation, the principle of negation, mm. that comes back again and again in different emergence vectors, fine. But you must be open to the fact that somehow, you know, some at some point in history, there could be an emergence where none of these principles apply any longer. That's a radical idea, emergence vector theory, that because the universe is fundamentally contingent, which in itself is a meta law mm. that we ask for here, because otherwise it would have to be absolutely determined beforehand, and that's reductionist, we have to remove that. Mm. But if there's contingency to everything, that means that mm. we don't know for a fact that there could be an emergence in the future yeah. where you know the three previous emergence vectors that I studied had a lot of commonalities, and that made it easier to explain them. But suddenly there's a new emergence that occurs where none of these things apply any longer. Which makes and the old emergences obsolete, right? Uh, no, 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 we have to rewrite no. the entire history of them, though. So you have uh -huh. to rewrite the emergence vector theory. I'll give an example of that. This is exactly what people are obsessed with, the hard problem between mind and matter. They don't allow mind to be so radically different from natural sciences. Mm -hmm. they try to turn mind into natural science, which is disastrous. You cannot understand mm -hmm. mind through the language of natural sciences just because mm -hmm. chemistry and physics and biology happen to share a lot of common qualities. But mm -hmm. you can study physics and chemistry and biology and discover that here, here's metaphors, there are, here are metaphors that I can use, and there are similarities in the natural sciences. It doesn't mean you can apply them. And, and one mm -hmm. of the radical ideas that Illung and I then have, which is where it gets really hilarious, is that if we then also add a previous emergence vector prior mm. to physics, which is exactly where physicists are getting interested these days, we mm. call that subphysics, and it's actually required for the universe to exist. That mm. means that in subphysics, it turns out subphysics has more qualities in common with consciousness than it does with physics. Mm. Okay. That's brilliant, though, because you could discover that an emergence there and an emergence there that don't seem to relate to one another, one wasn't born out of the other one, can have more similarities than two that are closely related. You don't have to assume that just because two emergence vectors are close to one another historically, they must also be the same. No, they can be radically different. And I think just when it comes to subphysics and physics, and the difference between those, that's when it gets mm. really weird and the differences are enormous. And the same thing I would say goes for the difference between matter and mind. Uh, is that a critique uh, of like uh, physicalism or something like that? Or am I, am I off? Oh yeah, you? we critique <laughs> materialism. Yeah. Material, right? that's what I meant, yeah. And, yeah. and, and physicalism. And, and yeah. physicalism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, physicalism is, is different from materialism in the sense that physicalism is the idea that everything is located in the universe. But if I, let's say, imagine, and then we have to discuss what the universe actually is, and this is a point Marcus Gabriel makes, but, but if I imagine a free-headed dragon, my idea of that doesn't it, it, it exist in the universe if we consider the universe the place where things exist. Yeah. It exists in my mind, it exists as an idea. So we also, like, so I, I don't know if me and Bart agree all the way there, this is something I got from Marcus Gabriel. But I would say physicalism, in a sense, is also reductive because we shouldn't necessarily assume that everything exists in the same place. But where I and also Bart diverges from Marcus Gabriel is that Marcus Gabriel has a, one, one could argue, slightly autistic idea that these different uh, domains, Marcus Gabriel called them, don't mm -hmm. in, uh, touch each other, they don't interact. They are separate from each other, like lay like untouchable layers. So they don't exist. Um, he, he has um it's kind of funny that Mr. Marcus Gable himself still though can understand that they're different domains and he can study them from where he operates from. So that it, it just doesn't make any sense. As far as we know, everything mm -hmm. that has existed in the universe, including our own minds and consciousnesses and everything since at least the big bounce, which I argue is the correct mm -hmm. term, not the big bang. Uh, and prior to it, which we also argue because we allow for a time dimension, which is prior to space time. But if you do that, if you made that assumption, then, then you, 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 it's possible 
and something could have diverged off and become its own emergence somewhere and then become isolated from, you know, for example, in the theories of parallel universes, that's perfectly acceptable. Mm. But we don't have any connections with any of these parallel universes anyway. We don't have any traces of them. And as long as we don't have that, everything we know so far has mm. been within the same honest universe. Mm. It, depending on the definition of universe, so I would say there's a contingency that they are connected, but I wouldn't necessarily think say that everything that exists exists physically. Because I, because no, no. again, no, I, would be, I, 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 I don't use that. I agree with you. I don't use the word okay. material or physical here, except in a very limited okay, sense. Physicalism. To the merge. But, but that's that's why that's why I prefer. So that's why, like, uh, so Marcus Capel distinguishes between the world and the universe. So yeah. the world is is um, is if you like Wittgenstein totality of facts, right? But but the world is is the domain of all domains, or let's say the vector of all vectors. And that's so if we we are talking about one world here, but I wouldn't necessarily say that everything that exists exists in the universe, because if it did, I wouldn't be able to imagine things that doesn't currently exist in the universe as physical objects. So yeah. there must be something yeah. which the, I'm the, imagining that isn't physical. Yeah, okay. So well, isn't there sort of in the imagination, there's there's an unlimited amount of forms and, you know, imaginal creations that, that sure. can, can occur, uh, which- Yeah, which, but we can- don't have a not, correspondence. Not, but listen, listen, guys, listen, guys. I've reality. written a lot about this. It's so but they're not represented but, necessarily. Yeah, but wait, 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 wait a second. Let, let's, okay. uh, let's not get into the ontology versus ontics debate all over again, because we've debated forever. So mm -hmm. we, we all know that we can imagine things that do not exist materially, and there are things that exist materially, and we have mm -hmm. imaginations about what exists materially. But, but the confusion here, we should point out, Marcus Gabriel is a great young German philosopher. He's known mm -hmm. for a book called The World Does Not Exist. And in this book, he confused it a bit because I actually, I use the terms universe and world opposite of him. Mm. I think the mm. world in a Freudian sense is what we experience as not ourselves when we're born. Like to anything else out there is world and the smaller mm. world grows into a bigger world as we grow older and understand mm. that the universe is much bigger. Mm -hmm. But I use the universe very much here like scientists usually do it. Like I respect the natural mm. scientists and say that, okay, the universe is whatever our existence is here, but within the universe, there are minds and consciousnesses and fantasies, all kinds of things. And then there are different ontologies. It's absolutely correct. But to not mm. confuse it, I would prefer if we don't talk about ontologies, but rather talk about the different emergence vectors uh, okay. on their own on their own conditions like so for example what is biology how do we define mm. biology what is it is or what is what is mind mm. and in what way has, does mind have an imaginary world and have has a symbolic world or or it assumes has a real order that it struggles with mm. all the time so but how, how is your how's your perspective then relating to relationalism because in many of our conversations we have seen relationalism as a more or less general principle uh, for all vectors, for all emergence vectors. No, I don't. I don't agree at all. I don't think subphysics okay. has any relationalism at all. Uh, I think. I think the subphysics yeah. is precisely different from physics because it does not contain relations. So when we talk yeah. about relationalism and why it's so important, this is where Whitehead comes into the picture, an old favorite of Ehrlich and me, mm. and mm. Hegel. I mean, Hegel and Whitehead are. To the two philosophers we, we build a lot of our work on. And, and the thing with Whitehead is that he basically says that everything you could understand of the world starts with relations and other relations come through lata. So we talk about yeah. objects, for example, they're only byproducts of projects. And because it's a product like a relation between the three mm. of us here and the people that participate in the conversation, we all become byproducts of this conversation when finally tonight somewhere the, call, you know, the, the, the recording stops and we go different ways again. And mm. the three people that go different ways have these conversations are the byproducts of the relations that we've been involved with. So, so the relations are primary. Things that are not but, relations. Uh, yeah, but okay. But, but, well, there is nothing but relations, basically. I mean, no, wait, that, that wait, would be wait. My, That would be my argument, at least. Yeah, wait, <laughs> you can't say that because if you do subphysics properly, you dig into subphysics, you realize hmm. that there are implicate things prior to explicit. I agree. We, we both so agree for with this. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about potentials that aren't yeah. actualized yet, that means the potentials are something that is not in a relation to something else because but an would, actuality is always relational. But I would all, also argue, and this is prop, maybe where we differ, but I would also argue that when you're talking about an implicate order or subphysics, we are basically talking about something which hasn't emerged into being yet. 
So yeah. the way, so it like the question is, is is it correct to use the concept existence, or should we, as like Wheeler and and Bump, try to say something like subsistence? Yeah, no, because I agree. it's n yeah. okay. So so, so relation, I would, a categorical difference. Is, no, relationalism is fundamental in the sense that anything that has existence is relational. That's the way totally white-headed. But prior to something existing, it can subsist. And because it can subsist mm. as a potentiality, for example, you could talk about the Higgs field in physics, for example. The Higgs field Absolutely. doesn't make any sense at all until something collides with the Higgs field and suddenly it gets weight. Mm. So in the fact that it works that way means that the Higgs, the Higgs field, for example, the fields that we talk about in physics should really be discussed as subphysical rather than physical right. because they do not have physical existence. They have a subphysical subsistence before mm. they have an existence. So mm -hmm. we always right. have to talk about there, there are prior to relations potentials and these potentials then become actualities. But as soon yeah. as we talk about something as being actual, we mean it has existence, it has to be fundamentally relational. Hmm. Yeah, I agree, I agree, yeah, I agree. So, that makes so, me think of light, you know, if you don't have something to bounce the light off of, then how do you know it's light or? Mm, absolutely, yeah. Does it and it's also like, it I, I, I would also light? take the implicate order f further than that because it's usually used, um, it's it's a, the implicate order is a concept that Bohm invented and Bohm was inherently a uh, determinist. We, we should just point out that David Bohm is a famous mathematician from the 20th century. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But his perspective was, um, and, and this ties in with Whitehead's idea of the creative unfolding, but basically that in order to have something like time, you need some rules that guide continuity, for instance. In order to have geometry, you need, some, you need the fundamental rules of geometry to be somewhere, because otherwise it's impossible to make any geometrical patterns or forms. So like there is a, there's something there before anything can be, but it's it's not there as, let's say, something which exists. It's something, it's a necessary precondition for existence. So it's not like a platonic form or, or something like that. Um... No, I think no, I think maybe Bohm flirted with that. He's a bit of a Platonist and so mm. was Whitehead. But I disagree that this is Platonism because I think at the end of the day, we have to admit to the fact that I, I would say that we understand things through these forms that we're born with. So that, that's perfectly okay. That's I think, that's I think Platonism becomes a reduction in its own right. Pla yeah, exactly. Pla like you should, if we should ever discuss Platonism, and, and I think we should, not necessarily this conversation because that could go on a tangent, but if we discussed um, Platonism, we should discuss it in the vector of mind so how the mind operates, how the mind perceives reality, but it has nothing to do with other vectors. They should be discussed on their own merit. And what we are really looking for is are there any underlying systems which we can use to freely associate? So it's not like if I talk about relation in the sense that me and Bart are relating and, and me and you, Andrew, Andrew and all of us, that's not the same type of relation as um, as we used to describe how atoms relate. So they, they are radically different, but also in some sense radically the same. And understanding the differences is, is also a way to understand how anything gains identity in the first place. So mm. for anything to gain identity, it has to be different from the whole, because if anything is identical to the whole, it is nothing. And this is an Hegelian argument as well. He made from the law of identity that nothing can be identical to itself and have an identity. There must be a difference. So when we when we look at all these vectors, one thing they share is that they are in completely different. And th this is also why um, vectors, emergence vectors, are different from paradigms. Because well, when we talk about the internet, we can say well, th this is basically just a new technology which is based on the same thing as the Turing machine and the Turing machine was based on like the language or written text so these are building upon each other in a very linear fashion where we don't need a um, radical new idea of how the world operates the thing mm -hmm. that's really interesting though is that these new paradigms creates new ontologies Yes. So, and yeah. so the thing is here, you pointed out that early, Andrew, is that when we do emergence vector theory, there's a parallel study we call paradigmatics. 
Hmm. And paradigmatic is how we understand how we as human beings deal with the specific period in history that we live in. Mm -hmm. To live in the internet age as we do now in the early 2020s is of course radically different than to have lived in the industrial capitalist age of the past or, or say uh, the, the land ownership feudalist age of the past or something like that. Hmm. So when a radical new information technology takes over the world and we human beings start to communicate in radically different ways, all our different narratives have to be rewritten and re-understood. And because they mm -hmm. have to be written and re-understood and the existential uh, quality of being human is completely different mm -hmm. all of a sudden, that means yeah. it's better to understand the world, starting with the current paradigm that we live in, than to try to understand the world through some old paradigm that actually has become redundant. And of course, the people who do understand the new mm. paradigm are the winners of that specific paradigm, whereas those who hold on mm. to a previous paradigm with all the different beliefs that belong to it will mm. be the losers. So that's kind of the critic critique we had of the Adam Curtis film, that it was sort of, uh, it was looking at the world through your view mirror in, in a, in a so yes, exactly. And not not it, confronting yeah, it, the precisely. reality of, of what, yeah. what we're, what we're up Adam Curtis is just looking moment. through the age we live in through some kind of 19th century, very capitalist, mm -hmm. nihilist uh, gaze, right? So that's exactly why he's, he, his conclusions are kind of terrible, but his documentary is interesting anyway. But but mm. you could we can both work with paradigmatics, which is how we understand different periods of human history in the fundamental sense. Mm. And then we have to decide what are the most important differences here that causes the most dramatic relations. So mm. the fundamental relations when we discuss society, for example, well, it turns mm. out that it makes sense in an information technological age like the current one to understand all of human history as different information technological paradigms. And that's what we do. We don't say Stone Age and Bronze Age and, and, and Gold Age or whatever, <laughs> because we used to have metals and minerals and industries dominating the economy. Mm. Rather, we understand the world from, oh, spoken, written, printed, mass distributed and interactive languages. Mm. That. The same thing goes so you can get inspired by paradigmatics to then go back and study emergence vector theory. That's what we do as philosophers. Or you can go into emergence vector theory, which is even more fundamental than these with even more grander relations, the most massive relations that ever occurred in history. The very mm. conditions on which suddenly human minds could occur and become their own emergence. And those mm. different emergence vectors are really interesting. And it's different, it's important to define them. But we will always, like Hegel says, we will always define them starting with ourselves, starting with yeah. us being human at the time where we live, and then say, okay, what would be the most, the best comprehensible way to understand the history of the universe that so makes sense to us? Hmm. And therefore, well, emergence vector theory is our answer to that question today. Yeah, and by understanding the, the like the paradigm we live in, we, we in some sense we can also understand why <laughs> materialism has been such a dominant ontology, because we are living in in uh, or we, we, we one could argue that we are moving out of it now, of course. But like in the last hundred years, we've been living, or maybe more actually, four hundred years to be to be more precise, we've been living in a uh, a paradigm which turned very mat materialist very fast. So that, that of course became our dominant way of understanding the world around us. And I think an important point is that then not to forget the wisdom that was, was acute in, in, in older paradigms, like Bart, for instance, who's very focused on the tribe. And in the tribe, there are some like fundamental symbols, which we also see in psychology, which we also see in anthropology, and we also see it in materialism. So, so we are looking at these patterns that are then understood differently through paradigms. But basically, what they're all trying to understand is like, um, like how, like how the universe really works. Mm. So, so I we agree. Are... So, so this is interesting. Here. We are attacking both liberals and Marxists and conservatives mm. and all the ideologists that came out of the enlightenment in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries because they're all materialists. Right. Well, why are they materialists? Right. They're materialists right. because they, they came out of a society where industry dominated culture mm. and the economy. Yeah, exactly. And, and with, with, the, with, with taking a materia and changing that materia into another material was how you made money and became influential mm. and powerful. So mm. that is precisely what makes sense that we talked yeah. about a metaphysics of the internet age because yeah. suddenly we because discovered like, that actually how you develop material is not the main value any longer and, and, and attention is yeah. more important than capital for example yeah. and, and that's what makes sense to discuss to, um, relations 
And this goes back to ancient Rome because like we have an idea that money is materialist, but actually the reason why we used to print money on silver was because silver was a symbol of the soul. And this goes into what is now called attentionalism, where we view value as something having to do with attention. It's something like we we bring into an object by like uh, focusing on it. But then like as, as Bart explained through the industrial age, we can, became obsessed with materia. And then we started viewing money as a material thing, but it's really not. And it's really not either of those, it's both of them. And it's yeah. even more than that. Mm-hmm. I would even argue that idealism, it was just supposed to be the opposite of materialism and the alternative during mm-hmm. the industrial and capitalist age. Idealism was basically a remnant from the previous paradigm in history. It came out of feudalism yeah. and mostly it was represented by, for example, Christianity in our part of the world. Like there'd be a soul that would not be the body and the soul could be eliminated from the body and the soul and body would oh, be separate. Gnosticism more specifically. Yeah, yeah, dualism. Yeah, so not, the point yeah. here though is that uh, now when we're discussing, we're still staying modest compared to the previous paradigm, but materia is no longer fundamental to us. Huh. That means, for example, that Whitehead was prophetic. What well, Whitehead wrote in the 1920s when he was really interested mm. in quantum mechanics, he was interested in everything that was going on, was that mm. he started discussing the world like maybe everything was originally relationalist. And the mm. precursor to that is actually Hegel, who, mm. you know, unintended unintentionally in the early 1800s, Hegel wrote about the logical science, but really it wasn't Mm. either logic or science he wrote about, because he actually wrote about a relationalist universe where he discussed it from the point of dialectics. And Mm. that's why taking, that's why there's a renaissance today for Hegelian dialectics. There's a Mm. renaissance for Nietzschean perspectivism. And there's a massive renaissance of Whiteheadian relationalism. Because of Mm. course we go back to the previous paradigm before the internet occurred and we think, Mm. Were there any thinkers out there who just by happened, being smart enough to happen to say something that actually is more relevant now than ever? And that's why we list Hegel and Nietzsche and Whitehead in a work all the time, because it precisely is dialectics and it's perspectivism and it is mm-hmm. relationalism that are very, mm-hmm. very useful today to understand mm-hmm. the world and, and to mm. understand ourselves and to understand how the universe operates from a relationalist mm. perspective, because what mm. we call it in the internet age, we call it network dynamics. Like mm. we just call Can it, I just we see if I get this all right? Like so, we're, so in a sense, we moved from this, like, uh, you know, in the Christian age, which was this Gnostic dualism, body, mind split, and very much a, a two world system, you know, to talk about John, using John Vervicki's language, a two world mythology, there's this world and mm. the other world. And, and then, and then we moved into humanism and, and we developed this very powerful materialistic philosophy, which has, has taken us up to now. And now we're moving into something else, right? Which is yeah. something to do with it, it, the previous paradigm ended up with this hard problem of mind versus matter. So we're which moving out of the materialistic system. paradigm. No, wait, 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 let sense. me finish that. Let me finish okay. that one first. Sorry. So the hard problem of mind versus matter just shows that that paradigm is over to me because actually it's not a problem at all. It's not any more problematic than the hard problem of the difference between chemistry and biology. Well, yeah. actually, that can make sense if you just discussed it in certain, cert, at a certain emergence life occurs. It could even have occurred at several different times, but the conditions existed mm. for life to suddenly occur and we don't, in a trans-deterministic mm. way and suddenly life mm. existed. And life then had its own laws based on the habits that happened to exist at the time when that mm. emergence occurred. Now, if that is the case, mm. then mind, as we think of it, is just like... You, Think of it like you have a life form first. Now the life form to operate and to have an interior and an exterior, it has to have some kind of a membrane. We call them membranics. That Mm. membrane eventually will see itself that there's an outside and inside and it will start to store information on the inside so it won't repeat mistakes because otherwise Mm. a life form will go extinguished in no time at all if it can't learn and learning requires memory and it's, so there's some kind of memory located somewhere within a life form at a very early stage for life to even exist. It's even preconditional for life as we think of it. Mm. And once you have a memory somewhere, that memory becomes incredibly priceless for that life form. So for the life form to exist evolutionarily, survive at all, it has to start protecting the memory. Now the memory then becomes its own little isolated unit within the life form. Mm. 
And if a memory becomes a donor isolated unit, we, we go into something called cephalization. I should query Daniel mm -hmm. Fraga for the term. Cephalization mm -hmm. means that, okay, you start protecting the most valuable thing, like we all do. The most valuable thing in our homes, we probably put at the most isolated, you know, insulated place in our apartment. So it's not, up. we don't put the most valuable things in our apartment at the door in case somebody breaks in. We probably put it, hide it somewhere, right? You cephalize what's most valuable to you. Any life form would do that. And because you cephalize it, it probably starts to sort of go off in its own way and take its own part. Like always poet, I, on the human body, the brain and the genital organs have a very specific positions in the human body because, you know, human beings obviously consider the genital organs and their brains to be more priceless than anything else they have, the more valuable, right? And because you cephalize things, equals start to operate in its own way. And then it's only a question of time before different life forms compete in a certain planet within mm -hmm. a biological ecosystem, where some mm -hmm. life forms start to cephalize into more and more complex systems mm -hmm. because the more complex, they require more energy, they require a longer childhood or an adoption stage, and that's more <clears> costly. <throat> it requires mm -hmm. larger populations of the specific creature for that to happen. And then mm -hmm. it can make sense that suddenly human beings start operating within that system sooner or later, yeah. or some other form of very intelligent life form compared to the more simple, stupid ones. And mm. you have an intelligent life form. It has enormous needs for defense systems. Mm. It has to have very strong membranics. That's why it's not enough for us human beings to just operate with the skin and being solo and being little mm. atomistic individuals out on our own in the world. We mm. very much need a society of some kind of many mm. human beings with different qualities to survive. Otherwise, mm. we can't have the large brains and the complex minds and mm. sort of how, having the artistic output that we can have as human beings. Mm. Mm. And adding to that, you can use the same principle for how like molecules interact because they have a nucleus which is protected and then they are interacting with each other through their electrons. And you could even take this further and say, well, a society also has a membrane and is interacting with other societies in the same way. So the interesting things about like these principles we discover to be true or let's say useful at least to describe one vector often can be associated to other vectors. So that's 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 one of the points I'm I'm trying to to get at. So so when we look at like um, the digital age today, we are of course going into a completely new paradigm. But to understand that paradigm we can also draw on some of these general principles, which are true across vectors. I do, but I, what I point out is that I'm, I'm an opponent to the idea of a general emergence theory. So, because for yeah, example- yeah, yeah. It, This, is, it, not, this it, is not a general emissions theory. No, but one of this the- is a system, This is a system theory. Yeah, but let me point out that one of the philosophers, one of our contemporaries has done great work in this department that you can study, to study somebody who's trying to grasp at a general emergence theory is Adrian Johnston. Adrian yeah, Johnston, yeah. great work. He's an American philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, he, saw, he, he calls his philosophy transcendental materialism. So it's a dialectical mm -hmm. materialism like with Zawa Shishik, but he's moved yeah. on to what he calls transcendental materialism. We are inspired a lot by Adrian's work, but one of the mm -hmm. mistakes we think Adrian is making is that he's trying so hard to get to some kind of general emergence theory. And when you apply a general theory and everything that occurs in the universe that was preconditional for that universe yeah. to exist. You are creating a God, now the creator God, and that's the problem with Adrian Johnson's philosophy. So yeah. we're just disqualifying the idea that it's yeah, very yeah. helpful for narrative, for ontology, to find similarities between different emergence vectors. It's certainly very helpful to find similarities yes. between paradigms when we, when we discuss what it means to be human and what human history is. But what is important here, to me at least, is to point out that because I know so many people are desperate to jump to general emergence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, it, sh it should be it should be understood that like even though that there are similarities, they are radical diff radically different still. So yeah. it's not that a general is why, emergence theory. Yeah. yeah, that is why we call this emergence vector theory. If it was possible to create a general emergence theory, we would call it general emergence theory yeah. because we call it emergence vector theory because precisely that's the point we arrived. We can say this is hmm. the most we can say about metaphysics today. This is this is a claim yeah. we can make about metaphysics. This makes sense. This is useful. This is yeah. pragmatic. This is, can be worked with. But but please don't jump to the conclusion you can you can you can get more out of this because then you're looking for patterns that simply do not exist or are not allowed. And I think the test question here is this one: What if an emergence would suddenly occur 
where none of the things you found that were applicable on all the previous emergences would be valid any longer. Well, then that emergence would disqualify what you just worked on. So don't even the, go there. The God particle or something disqualifying what Einstein discovered or something like that. Yeah, because then again, if that emergence occurs because it did not occur prior to that actuality, that occurrence, it doesn't well, really apply what existed prior to it. It only applies think, to what happens after it. But I think you're negating the importance of the interpreter like by saying that because like we, we will always be framed within a narrative structure. So like I'm not making any claims about the untick, the reality of the untick at all. But I'm saying that for us to understand at least a fraction of it through ontology, there must be some, uh, this is why like I'm, I use association because of heart, but for us to engage with it, these patterns are not there because of the untick, but because of us. Well, you know, yeah. Like, so oh, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily, I'm saying that I, I agree that the next paradigm can, can usher in a new, new ontology or a new understanding that is completely foreign to us. Materialism would have been completely foreign to early Christians, completely foreign to early Christians. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that when we engage with materialism, we aren't relying on the same narrative principles that early Christians were. So there's a continuity. Agree, there's a continuity yeah, between uh, between each paradigm, uh, uh, some kind of continuity. Um, well, because it's fr it's framed it's framed within an interpreter, so we, we like we, we have to interpret what we are understanding. This is not a claim about the untick at all, but this is just like for for anything to have any meaning, it must be interpreted. Yeah, so if in my mm -hmm. work with Sadequist, we, we discussed the three different narratives rather than two mm -hmm. because we have a dialectics of narratives. We call these three narratives logos and mm -hmm. pathos and mythos. And mm -hmm. human yeah. beings can only try to grasp the world or create a world for themselves using one of these three or, or hopefully all three when they try to do it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all narrative. So there's a pathical yeah. narrative, there's a mythical narrative, there's a logical narrative, and they struggle yeah. with one another all the time. So, mm -hmm. but everything we do as human beings, because we understand the world through narratives, that's all there's to it. There's nothing beyond the narratives. There's, there's no mm -hmm. meta language as Jacques Lacan. There's no post-narrative no. uh, state or, or... No, but then, but no, then we have, then we have mm -hmm. the other, right? So we know what narrative is and what it isn't. So we always leave room for the other which is we, we are petrified mm -hmm. by. So there is always like what 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 something is is as much defined by what it is as was it what it isn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the so, way so, we solve that, wait, let me point out what dialectics really is here. Right. So uh, most people get stuck in a sort of logos versus mythos. Uh, mm -hmm. understanding or narrative. Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. for example, is always jumping between these two. It's simply mm -hmm. by adding pathos as the third narrative and understanding pathical as a narrative that you actually get three. As soon as you have three, you have no balance. You get rid of all ideas to give you balance or harmony. You're in a constant, uh, you're in a constant, at any, at any point, you're in a constant state where none of these are harmonious or balanced in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They're always struggling with one another. And a way to frame it in a sort of gender sense which could be funny is to say that men tend to struggle between logos and pathos and they can't make up their minds whether they're logical or pathical. And they're also forced to try to understand through some kind of mythical narrative. Women are always in the mythical narrative in general. They're very much mythos. Their problem though is that they tend to ignore the power of logos mm. or the power of pathos because they stand in the mythical realm. This is a constant interesting conflict between female and male narrative. You can look at literature, mm. for example, and you understand that really brilliant female writers are incredibly good at the mythical. But when you go to say uh, uh, the male expression or, or sort of more dominantly masculine writers, they tend mm. to jump between and live within the confusion. They're stuck in the logo, in logos, yeah. They, no, they're not stuck in the, they're stuck in the opposition between logos and pathos yeah. all the time. If they're just stuck in the logos, they're just terrible writers. Yeah. And if they're stuck in the pathos, they probably can't write at all. So, yeah. so they have just feelings and they can't write. So. It well, I guess if you're stuck in the logos, it's your, it's this autistic style, right? And if you're, stuck, you're probably stuck in the pathos, a Platonist, you're, you're, yeah, probably, you're probably, I don't know, you're like um, the market you saw. Or, producer. <laughs> you're probably a Platonist <laughs> doing mathematics, mistaking it for being literature. Yes, that's how Something terrible like you are. That. Mm, yeah. So, so these three, these three narratives help us create a 
dialectical realm, which is Hegel's point. And because mm-hmm. dialectical means don't look for a balancing, just just look for throw things in there, go for the for go for the different narratives. And that's exactly what I'm talking about these days. I think dialectical is needed today is to go back into the pathical narrative, which is ignored in contemporary society. Um, you go, for example, into realm of secular modernity, like uh, Curtis that we discussed previously, yeah. does constantly. Mm. And why it gets so poor and why nothing interesting comes out of it. And he goes, comes back to the same cynical, nihilistic endpoint all the time and he can't get out of it. It's because he's ignoring the pathical. He's ignoring the pathical mm. all the time. And, and that's why I think it's important today to stress what I call phallic philosophy. I actually do not celebrate philosophers at all. I don't celebrate, you know, the realm I come from in the work of the research. I celebrate engineers. The critique we're going to do in process and event, our new book, is basically saying that the axial age, we had all these mm. pillar saints and boy pharaohs of history, is completely overrated. The Bronze Age that preceded when people built shit and invented things like irrigation and aqueducts mm. and water floods and controlling rivers and mass agriculture and built important massive stuff and invented. Mm. I think that to me as a philosopher is way more important. And we, you know, I, I don't look for more Buddhas out there. I look for more constructors who build amazing things. And that's simply because mm. with the dialectical mode we're in currently in the 2020s, that's what we need to look next. They yeah. need less Platonists in the world. And, <clears throat> and they poisoned Silicon Valley, and that's the Silicon Valley will go down because the last thing we needed was more Platonist artists in the world. That's so, Elon, you're, you're a scriptwriter, right? So, so how do you work with the pathos and the logos and the mythos in, in your writing? I'm just curious. But we do music. That's one thing. Yeah. Well, um, I, I think, I think um, all, all writing comes from a place of pathos, at least for me, but I, I try to structure it within logos, of course. Yeah. So, so you you work from a place of of feeling, but also you have a intuitive understanding that that feeling doesn't necessarily um, lend itself very well to to a narrative, and we can we can tell this from dreams, for instance. So a lot a lot of my dreams, when I have them, I think, wow, this is going to make an amazing movie, and like just when I wake up, I think I'm gonna write this down, and then I discover well, it makes no sense because it was all pathos. There was no there was no structure to it so so what you are basically doing is that you're going into a space which is common to all of us which is like our collective unconscious or what well, subconscious if, if, if you prefer to call it that then you are trying to dig out things and then you are using logos to structure it yeah i uh, don't know if me and bart uses mythos um in in the exact same way um well, so, okay, so okay. I'll give you an example. So, so okay, you, when you go to a police station, you're gonna make a report, and you've been observed something, and you're supposed to be the witness at a court. You're expected to return mm. with a logical narrative. You're expected to say that I recall mm. that this happened at this specific time. This happened, and this happened. And when you start to go off and sort of speculate on the feelings you had, or the feelings of the victim or the crime, whatever, mm. then hopefully a lawyer stops you and say, "No, no, 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 don't even go there because we really just want to know." how you could recall and tell us exactly what happened at each specific moment in time when this process occurred. That's, that's the attempt of making a logical yeah. narrative. Now, that would be horrible in the theater. Yeah. That'd be horrible in a movie. Mm. But on the other hand, you have the opposite, which is the pathical narrative. And they do exist. They, they take up about 25% mm. of the world's internet broadband. It's called pornography. That's precisely why pornography mm. and movies don't go together because once, pe- once people start fucking right in front of you and in front of the camera, right, it becomes pornography. And usually there's, there's not much minutes. logos there. Uh, no, it's pathos. It's, it's pure, pure pathos. pathos. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's exactly, for example, well, why when we, for example, when you see a really violent movie or a violent computer game and you get used to shoot out a boom, 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 and there are 50,000 corpses on top of one another, and you're just playing the game, and you're bored, and you have a chewing gum. And mouth and then suddenly you see islamic state warriors slowly cutting off the head of a guy who's alive while you're watching it it becomes Whoa, oh god it's horrible right because pathos is really really horrible in the sense that it touches the nerve directly whereas when we look at something mythical in that case mythical really mythical in almost boring sense it's a computer game because it's so bland it's so removed from reality for us this is how mythos and pathos and logos operate and the great thing is that there are three 
precisely because mm. that we don't get stuck in a dichotomy where we argue mm. back and forth whether it should be logos or mythos. We rather look at all three of them and we then understand what it means to be human and engage in narratives. And all yeah. the narratives that are important to us, science tries to be a logical narrative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you go yeah. to see theater, you know, you, you expect it to be mythical narrative of some kind. And the pathical narrative deals with, you know, the practical narrative always deals with the things that I say that try to keep your kids away from it. You, you would prefer to, mm. as it deals with like really tough, violent stuff, or like we talked about you and Andrew a lot, with Thomas Amarik, for example, the difference between Sutra and Tantra, when you move it to Tantra, you're definitely the practical realm. Mm. Well, for me, I would say that, that the way I understand mythos is basically the, like the, the understanding throughout history of how pathos has been structured into logos. So we have these mythical structures, which we are just, we, like if we have, you can't, okay, so, so a tip, a quick screen uh, writing tip. You can't invent a new story. You have to understand what myth are, are your story re retelling. So, so when, when you go into like, let's say the difference between telling a lawyer what happened to you and then making a, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say an, uh, a poetic story, is that the poetic story all, always referencing like this cultural catalog we have of stories that have already been told. So yeah. I would say in, in, in mythos- Yeah, it's uh, Cain and Abel or it's, it's the- Ford Yeah, Cain and Abel. Or, or it's whatever, these are all, they're just recycling the same, you know, primordial myths. Um, yeah, I could give you an example actually how it operates that uh, the American director, Godfrey Reggio, who is like an art film director, he, he made his Coin mm -hmm. Scotsy, which I regard as the beginning of the Internet age. It opened in 1982, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And, and this, this great art movie where he tons of pictures and beautiful music by Philip Glass. And he basically writes the history of mankind up until the point where we live in the current chaos. And he does a wonderful job, mm. much better, much more artistic and deeper than curtains, for example. But when he did that, mm. Reggio was looking at the idea that the internet is this idea with cybernetics, that suddenly there's a technology that connects all human beings on the planet. And whereas we human beings need a lot of borders and limits and constraints to actually operate, these membranes that we talk about, this technology seems to operate in a way that it doesn't need any membranes at all. It regards planet Earth as its own membrane and it's actually becoming the membrane of that planet, which is mm -hmm. the satellites that construct the internet today. So he saw this prophetically in the 1980s. This came out of cybernetics from Norbert Wiener, Buckminster Fuller, Bateson, a lot of American sort of Californian thinkers had thought of this before. Mm -hmm. and, and then he started thinking that, but this idea, is it really new? Is, is it a new myth mm -hmm. we're making? And he discovered that the Hopi Indians in Nevada and Arizona yeah. had always had a myth that one day there would be a giant spider and this spider mm. would then create a web and this web would connect all human beings on the entire planet or the entire world so they would directly talk to one another. And that mm. would be like an end time, it would be what we now call the new paradigm. So the idea that there could be something like an internet age was actually mm. explored by mythical narrative writers in the Hopi mm. Hopi Indians, you know, hundreds of years mm. ago. And then he took that myth and made it the starting point, and that's why the movie is called Kohen So mm -hmm. the point here is that even if we do run into a new paradigm in history, which mm -hmm. is the only time we can really talk about anything novel, like anything mm -hmm. new happens to us. Mm -hmm. So we're the same human beings who always were. We rarely mm -hmm. change, and it takes forever for us yeah. to change, hundreds of thousands of years. So that's why the myths are always the same ones. But e even yeah. if there's a new technology, you can bet that somebody's been out there prophetically inventing or imagining some kind of a story that actually makes sense to understand that yeah. you can live it. Well, it's basically Nietzsche's like eternal return combined with like the phallic symbol of Lacan, right? So you have like something which keeps repeating, but it changes with the new paradigm. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I would add, yeah, it is the eternal return of the same, but it adds an event. And what's important here is this is where I break with nomadology that we but talk it's a, about. But it's a phallic event, right? Like, yeah, a phallic, a phallic like, event. Uh, sorry, yeah. a phallic, we, we undoubtedly have had events in history that dramatically changes everything forever. And as Hegel says, forces us to rewrite the narratives about ourselves in our world. Mm. So we call these emergences when we look at the larger metaphysical picture. When we look at the historical picture, what it means human and human history, then we call them mm. paradigms. And mm. in the major events 
in this case, a paradigm shift or an emergence are both major events. And the major events mm -hmm. are part of the idea that there are things that do change history forever mm -hmm. once they occur. Yeah. And we call them eventologies. And that's mm -hmm. why I, I work with eventology. Our, our new book is called Process and Event. Process meaning nomadology, mm -hmm. event meaning eventology. Mm -hmm. But eventology is not opposed to nomadology. It's a possible addition. And yeah. this is what Nietzsche was looking for when he talked about the eternal recurrence of the same. Mm. For him, it was an ethical principle. I should live my life as if anything that I did is something I would do over and over again and still be mm. happy and smiling on my face, being very pleased that yeah. I'm doing it. But what he meant was that if an event occurs that changes history forever, for example, his yeah. idea of somebody who breaks with the death of God and therefore realizes mm. that he's free to construct a whole new world, which is, this is, this is uh... himself is an eventologist too. But yeah, absolutely. But this is the Freudian association. So like Nietzsche's, Nietzsche might have been talking about ethics, but we have the same thing in the karmic wheel, right? Like these, these stories exist in different cultures because they're aiming at the same underlying narrative structure. Yeah. So what we, are seeing, what we are seeing is that, I'm adding one more thing. So like we have the concept of DNA, right? But like in ancient Peruvian tribes, you had the concept of the cosmic serpent. Okay, so I'm not saying I'm not saying that ancient Peruvian tribes had an idea of what DNA would mean to us, but the ancient like the idea of the cosmic serpent was two intervened serpents making the symbol. You have it as well at um, what is it called? The Greek uh, the Greek uh, not God. He was actually a person, but the Greek hero of medicine, his staff. But the, it also has the symbol of DNA on it. Yeah, I'm not I know. That but, knew what, but, yeah. But, yeah, but what's but it's important the same, here? It's the same narrative repeating. Yeah, no, but the, the thing though is that nomadology is all there, has always existed. Our story about ourselves originally in the tribe, while we were on the move, was that everything returns to the same. So it's spring, then comes summer, then comes fall, then comes winter, then comes spring again. Oh, and spring becomes yeah. another spring. It's not the same spring, but it's still the same spring. So that's the eternal return of the same. So all yeah. anthropologists like Mircea Ali are the other ones agree that this is mm -hmm. the fundamental story. I would argue then that the only new narrative that really occurred starts with Zoroaster in Persia, 3,700 years ago, when Zoroaster realizes because the material conditions within which human beings can radically change because of technological innovation due to the fact that there's more information available, meaning that for the first time, the son can dream about a world that's different from his father's and a world that's more complex. Okay, that creates the so idea of that's, You're saying that- kind that's, of, also, that's also oh, easy to say because it's one of the first things written down in history. <laughs> so it's easy no. to say that we don't know anything before it. No, well, novelty as a concept. You don't have any no, no, evidence. I'm no, 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 I'm, I'm, no, no, novelty I'm as a concept part. does not exist prior. And that's why it never really well, we took have off any, in India and China. Text prior. India, have... and China, India and China have okay. stayed nomadological ever since, especially India. And nomadology today, as we know it, is called Hinduism. And it's also very popular, for example, in Russian culture. Many Russians, like Dugin, mm. they believe in the eternal return of the same. The traditionalist and political philosophy today, they return like Evola, the other guys that a lot of people on the, especially the old right are studying. They also believe in the eternal return of the same and everything else is illusionary. There are no novelties. Any novelty you could think okay, of is illusionary. Yeah. The difference with that is Zoroastrianism was that with Zoroastrianism arrived, they did no, no things can happen. And once they happen, history changes forever. That's why Judaism, Islam and Christianity that we base the West on are all eventological uh, yeah, we've religion. talked about that before. How there's there's yeah. a, there's a break in the West almost with you know, I guess Zoroastrian than Judaism, where a, a narrative uh, comes in, which is not just nominological, right? You know, traditional exactly. stories are kind of a bit absurd, right? They just go around in a circle, and there's some, mm. you know, nothing really happens almost, and then and then suddenly there's this there's this incredible drama that happens, you know, which becomes historical in a sense. And that's that's eventol eventological, um, yeah, know, from, from, from a human perspective, or, or yeah, from the from human, a perspective. human perspective, yeah, from a human perspective, I would say that that makes sense. It could be when we look at the ultimate emergence vector in the sense that it could be subphysics, because subphysics, after all, is, 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 it's a turtle at the bottom, let's call it that, right? So the, the turtle's on top of the oh, turtle at like the bottom, that. as we know, it is subphysics, <laughs> but, like but it, could, it could turn out very much that, that the big bounce, 
Okay, the big bounce actually leads to a universe, the one we know now, and we're part Mm -hmm. of. And that universe, after hundreds of billions of thousands of billions of years or whatever, finally just becomes a bunch of photons where space time makes no sense any longer. That leads to another big bounce. So it's not that it's not it's not that the universe implodes. Roger Penrose is arguing is rather that the universe comes to a point where there's nothing left that has any mass. And if there's nothing left that has any mass, it doesn't make any sense to even talk about space time. And that's exactly when a new big bounce occurs. Now, that is interesting. If Penrose is right, which probably never will be proven, it turns out nomadology wins in the sense that everything does return to the same, but in a huge cyclical way. But it doesn't make any sense for us in the societies we live in today. We look at the paradigm, we look at contemporary society, we look at the kind of narratives that we need that we don't have yet, the kind of storytelling about ourselves we haven't written yet that we want to do, and which is what we do when we do metaphysics after all. We go, ba- we well, go back to perfect. what, what well, is the narrative, creatures, or narrative right? Like that's what we are. Well, uh-huh. I would say I would say that it made perfect sense that if you argue that Sorastra is the first one to introduce novelty, that he's the first one to do it, because before that there could be no novelty. Exactly. So in like yeah, so it has to it has to happen in the same way that if we imagine like uh, like previous bounces of theories, there has to be there has to be one bounce that introduces the idea of novelty, but mm-hmm. be- because before that is the same. Yeah. So that's yeah. The, like that's the that's the first occurrence of something new, and then it keeps on repeating. Yeah, and this is the novelty is basically technological most of the time. It's it's cultural, definitely mm-hmm. cultural. So, for example, uh, to come up with the idea that we should build a temple between two rivers because these two rivers are constant conflict with one another, wouldn't make any sense. Society would constantly on the move because we would just cross the river mm-hmm. and move on to the next river and go on somewhere else. And depending on the season, depending how many competitors we have to to gather food and to hunt and things like that, we just move on. They wouldn't be permanently settled populations. But once you get permanently settled populations, they're very likely to try to stay along a river because they can produce a lot of food there. But mm-hmm. rivers are also incredibly to be vulnerable places to be. So it's very, mm-hmm. very likely that the river valleys were first densely populated, but also were a cause of war for one another. And sooner or later, somebody must come up with the idea that maybe we could just fool these two different river populations to actually share a temple between the two rivers so they can go to that mm-hmm. temple. Now, of course, the construction of that temple becomes then an event in history. It makes sense for people to say that there has never been a temple before. And mm. we never worship God in a temple like this one because we never built mm. a temple. We never built a temple city. Mm. We never built a temple city that became a trading post because it had a larger mm. population located in one place that actually happened to be multicultural population that represented mm. different cultures and therefore trading started to make sense. So then of course we started to think of history more and more like, okay, there's a civilization here. And mm. civilization does require the concept of novelty. And that's exactly yes. why we have to permit to settle. We have to have some kind of technology that makes it possible for us to permit to settle. And I would say that has to be an information technology that starts to store information outside our own brains. And mm. then we go back to the concept of cephalization. Mm. cephalization. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. didn't quite get that, actually. So, I'd like you to elaborate on cephalization okay. because you were talking okay. about how that we, 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 we guard our most precious things. And then, then that led to another kind of they can sort of boom pop off like so for Mm. example you have a lot of things boiling in your mind and you think a lot and your brain has gotten a lot bigger because you happen to eat meat rather than just vegetables and so do Elon and so do I and we're hanging out together and we try to fantasize about things and then we started sort of you know, when you invent in a nomadic tribe, you lose that innovation very quickly. It's not like you invent something that stays mm. with you because the knowledge has to be memorized. And memorization mm. is a very limited storage space to, to basically. But we memorized everything until we could write. But once we could write, it was the guy who could write things down. It was clever enough to get a little paper book and paper and a pen, mm. rather the guy who had the biggest brain for memorization who became the winner. That was a different condition. Mm-hmm. And mm. what was then writing down information, it was storing information outside of your own brain. Now, if you store information so in your own brain, information itself has cephalized. Hmm. It has become something that it's still your brain cooking over and it's, it's making up things, but it, it's cephalized, so it sort of pull, pulled off and become its own thing. And what then happens is that you have two different information storage spaces. Oh, one of them is hmm. your mind and one of them is a book. 
-hmm. And because you can store tons of information in the book, you have to figure out where it is. You have to sort of index it. You have to invent mm -hmm. systems where you index that. But it turns out you can both do debit and credit, for example, when you do finances. You can write a story about your tribe, where you came from, and who was the Ur father, and who was mm -hmm. the Ur mother. And you can make a very elaborate story because of it. Because you don't have to think like, I'm going to invent a story here like Elon does when he writes a script. You don't have to think that I can invent a story, but it has to be memorizable. It has to be, at least it has to be somebody out there who can memorize the story. Otherwise, it's yeah. not a story. You can rather say that, oh, my story can be 500 pages long. I can write a Russian novel because I can write a book. That's mm. what cephalization means, why it's so important in the work mm. when you do membranics, is that you got to understand mm. that once you put the information outside of the membrane, and make mm. its own storage space for it and protect that. Mm. It's called a library. Yeah. Then the, the library itself to, um, will become, become, become a unit that can eventually cephalize. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 Whitehead calls it society and not civilization, but it's basically the same concept you're describing. Yeah, because he wanted to use it more generally and he does so very cleverly, mm. I would say. Yeah. Mm. Civilization is something I only use for human beings. Mm. Yeah, or back, could, yeah, yeah, you called them cultures, bacteria cultures. So but. we're not, at the moment, we're not just storing stuff in books, we're storing stuff on the internet, right? What are the ramifications yeah. of that? I mean, we're storing everything, basically. This is being stored on the internet. Um, it's another cephalization, and there's way mm. more information being stored. And, and also what's important here is because of electricity flows, we can also process that information. So whereas a library, you just stored tons of shit and you got to have a librarian old lady who knew where to find things and you have to go to that specific source to find whatever you were looking for and then hopefully you put together something and you know things like footnotes still surviving mm -hmm. text because of it which is kind of ridiculous because these days you hyperlink every word you write you can press any word you like in any text you write and then have a whole wikipedia page just to the title that word mm -hmm. so but we, people still do footnotes because they live in an old paradigm and try to insist that the paradigm will still exist that's an example of that but but once, once the internet is here, and it is, and it stores the information, mm. and it processes information, then the processing power increases, and the capacity of the process increases, and we start invent new things, whole new phenomena, based on the mm. fact that the processing information can create that. And eventually, mm. out of that will come something that we talk about called sensocracy, for example, mm. that we could have basically control the entire planet as a global empire, simply by having sensors and senses and information processing mm. occurring just about everywhere. Mm. So th those are logical conclusions of the fact that once you start working with membranes, memory, civilization, and intense information processing. Of course, these systems also become more vulnerable in the process. Uh, yeah. if there were nomadic tribes on the planet and somebody blew up an atomic bomb there are probably quite a few nomadic tribes left the problem with contemporary society if you blow up an atomic bomb somewhere now it, we might literally all go down the, the, the more complex a system becomes the more vulnerable it also becomes that's always been you know what has plagued humanity mm. 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 yeah so we're, we're, we're intensely vulnerable right now how are we going to survive i mean we are intensely vulnerable, but the hope we have is that we're also more aware of what going on, what's going on. So take, for example, the current COVID-19 pandemic. It, it's, not even, it's not even close to being one of the worst pandemics we've known. It's not even close yeah. to the Hong Kong flu in the 1960s and nobody canceled mm. Woodstock, did they? No, but we're hysterical because the pandemic is the first pandemic in the internet age. Mm, Human beings no, cannot definitely. handle the fact that information is now widely available to just about everybody on the spot. So they mm. react hysterically at just about everything. They, mm. they react as everything they hear is a sensation and they get very exhausted and tired from it. I, I can't even imagine how long the queues to the psychiatric care units will be once this pandemic is finally yeah, over. No kidding. Both mm. because of the pandemic and because of the hysteria and the lockdowns mm. and everything else we've done. Yeah. No, but we can also learn from that experience. And of course, one of the beauties of the internet is that if you do get sick from COVID-19, your doctor doesn't know that much. You can go online and probably find thousands of people around the world that speak your language and are in exactly the same condition that you are. And you can then make huge improvised parallel studies to try to figure mm. out how to cure yourself from COVID-19, which explains why we had vaccines against COVID-19 within a year. That would have been mm. on 
unthinkable in 1968. So you can see mm. both the advantages and the disadvantages yeah. of the specific paradigm we live in. And I think that's mm. the lesson to learn when it comes to paradigmatics is that the world doesn't ever get better. It tends to get more complex, at least so far. And, and because it's more complex, it's more yeah. complicated to try to understand it. it but it also yeah. has enormous benefits that we should try to focus on. It gets darker and lighter at the same time, kind of. Or... Exactly. Yeah. Again, yeah. the beautiful old word, pharmacon. Mm -hmm. It's both yeah. the potential for something fantastic, and it's also the potential for something disastrous. Well, it's also like the, the, the new big bound. So we are recreating the new myths for, for a new paradigm. In some yeah. sense, like we are, we are recreating the idea of like the flood, and now we are reacting like to it as though it's a flood. But like then later, like uh, events like this become more manageable. So because we are entering in a new paradigm, we are also creating a new mythos. And one way we can see this is because like the most fucking popular movies at 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 the time are superhero movies, which are the like. Those stories have been told so much that it's insane that we aren't tired of them. But the reason why we are suddenly developing an interest in them again is because the new paradigm demands that these stories are told again. Are, aren't we yeah. fed up with those those superhero things yet? I... Well, not if you look at their like uh, income. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they're new kids, they're new generations coming all the time, and you know they they yeah. breed and they grow grow they grow up quickly. They need so, superhero stories. Yeah, too. there's a constant well, feed well, of ten year olds. But but your point here, Elon, is absolutely correct. It's that that's why we're writing philosophy about the messianic. That's what we're writing philosophy well, about. Well, that's not death. Super, we're writing philosophy myth. about right. people who can personify the event, and that's exactly what the superhero myth is coming back again in a big way. Yeah, but mm -hmm. they, they went out of vogue. It's not because like every generation of 10-year-olds have been obsessed with superheroes. Like These stories pop up in history at pretty specific times. In times of like crisis, I, said, I imagine, or in times of collapse. Well, in, in, time, it's, in times of new paradigms. So new like, paradigms. if you look mm -hmm. at when Superman came came into the world like we had a new new um we had, we had a new uh well the uh what was it called like um it was just after the second world war that's when superman came into the picture so so a radical new technology and um in factories like what is what is the specific thing called like automatic factories was invented so we yeah. needed a new superhero to keep up with that so like he was able to like leap leap over tall buildings which was like, like you don't really see that anymore. Now it's more like, um, like traveling uh, across the world in an instant. So like the myths also change depending on the paradigm. And like the old heroes, like Achilles and Hercules, they're like traveling around in their cities because like the way they perceive society wasn't necessarily larger than what you could feasibly travel. So, so these stories, pop up again at certain times. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Go, and that's, yeah. that's again, one of the interesting, when we talk about metaphysics of the internet age, we can also metaphysics, mm. it can also be smaller. It doesn't have to be the size of a murderous vector theorem, which incorporates everything like in the universe. Mm. It can also be much smaller. And metaphysics here, for example, is the disappearance of space, uh, which is, is unique to our age. Mm. And, and it's just that starting with the telegraph, as, as Marshall McLuhan pointed out. That's so McLuhan, yeah. With telegraph, we could have information that traveled at the speed of light. And that was like incredibly miraculous. I mean, information going between Europe and America would take the weeks it would be to be the time it would take to be on the boat. Otherwise, mm -hmm. people would not know in New York what happened in London. Suddenly, the telegraph came along and there were cables under the Atlantic Ocean. And you could know within seconds in New York what had happened in London. And, and that, of course, that started mind spinning and new mythologies were created, yeah. new myths were created because suddenly space started disappearing. And today, even if you move our physical bodies on the planet, we move them at least before prior to the corona, mm. we move them in flights and it would take you no more than 24 hours to travel, for example, from Scandinavia to New Zealand, which mm. is probably the longest flight distance in the world. You could mm. get from one part of the, of the planet to the other one within a day. Now mm. that would be absolutely, totally, unfathomable 200 mm. years ago. But Absolutely. even physical bodies can travel in 24 hours and we can go online. I have Zoom conversations these days when I'm sitting in Europe, another guy's in Australia, third guy's in North America, and we don't even care. Space has disappeared. Mm. But what it does though, it means that the other axis, which is time, 
has become incredibly important to us. And in the world of philosophy, we now deal with are the different time dimensions, existentialist philosophy deals that, mm. oh, you live now, you will die one day, you were born one day, what does it mean to be born? What does it mean to die? Mm. All these things, the obsession with the time axis and the obsession with, it, with, 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 with linearity and non-linearity and different aspects of time are enormous these days, simply because space is no longer the sort of this enormous thing to overcome. Space has expanded, ironically, mm. but that's cosmology. Mm -hmm. And we're not even part of cosmology. Cosmology is a myth that we are not even close to being part of. Yeah, We just observe, mm. we, we, we can't even fathom that a light we're looking at the moment is actually 3 million years old or something like that from where it came from. But we still talk about it like it's happening to us because it's happening to us now. Again, different emergence sectors make, make us confused. Mm. But on the planet Earth that we live on, mm. space has disappeared. And because mm. it's disappeared to us, then time becomes more important. And that shift it's, shifts the mythology yeah. completely. The myth, myths become much more obsessed with the intensity of time mm. than it is Absolutely. obsessed with, with space anymore. Like what's an example of that? I, well, why would, you know, what would that look like in terms of storytelling? Why? Well, know, Anna, Anna well, just mentioned it. it then, um, well, yeah, the yeah, superheroes, I, I gotta say, the superheroes all try to save the planet from an asteroid or something like that. Mm. And they go out uh, there and there's an event. There's an event where they, where they stop the asteroid from hitting the planet and they save whoever is still alive on the planet, things like that. Mm -hmm. okay. another, another, another way of looking at it is that like when you look at when Frankenstein became an immensely popular monster, that was a time where medical development suddenly happened, happened at a such, such a radical pace that it introduced new paradigms. And the same is like when we say that not every 10 year old is fascinated by superheroes. You have to remember that Oliver Twist, for instance, used to be one of the most popular children's stories. And we had like, there was a long, long period of time where like the, the heroes of children were like uh, folk, like, uh, like uh, uh, adventures, like uh, Hans and Greta and so on. So it changes depending on the society. Like what the narrative does is reflect how mm. like these myths relate to the society we are in currently. So yeah. it's basically I, I would like agree. a temperature. I would agree, yes, yeah. The superior becomes a lot less important, for example, we had a society of, of say strong economic growth and, and a lot of social change and a lot of very present fathers or maybe even aggressive mm. fathers or, or you know, very mm. dominant fathers. It's That's rather why all it's superhero just, movies it's rather were shit in the 90s. Yeah, but it's rather a society that sort of gets stuck. We're, it's also we're a society stuck. that has forget, forgotten uh, the Messiah or, you know, or the... No, uh, wait, 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 wait. That's precisely what I'm talking about. A society that's forgot where well, the fathers are less present, at least imagine yeah. in an imaginary mm. world, they're less present. That's a society where the little boys start dreaming about superheroes and superhero stories mm. become more important. But of course, the Messiah is the grown-up superhero version. Uh, okay, yeah. and, and the Messiah as portrayed in Judaism and Christianity is often presumed mm. to be one person, usually a man, but the original mm. concept of the social in Zoroastrianism mm. uh, of the savior in the sense, it's, it's, that, it's that phenomenon that happens. It doesn't have yeah. to be certain. Well, that's also true. It, in, in, in yeah, it could be a new culture. The Christos isn't like, necessarily a person. It's, it's a presence of renovating the society. Yeah, mm. that's why we don't yeah. talk about the Messiah when I talk about it in our work. We talk about the messianic. Yeah. And the messianic mm. is what we're all looking for today. Who's going to mm. get us out of the current predicaments we're stuck with? Mm. Yeah, and absolutely. It, yeah. And children respond to that by being obsessed with superhero stories because they obviously have the same core of subconsciousnesses that the adults do. It, it's just, it's just, well, like society. superheroes are, are in some sense trying to approach the Christ myth, but not really getting there. So, what you usually see is that, like, you have the pantheos of heroes. And then like Christ emerges as a combination of their attributes, but then Christ has to die and go away because that, that story can't be retold after it's done once. Mm -hmm. So that's basically like, if we're looking at where we are now, we are in the pantheon of superheroes. Soon a Christ story will emerge. So we will have maybe like five years where there's a lot of Christ stories, then that will die down. And we have to understand, like this is happening happening now at a radically faster pace than it was like in, in Greek times. There, it's happening much faster. Substitutes for the real thing in a way, the superheroes, I, I feel they're, they're kind of- Well, they're always ideals. So the only way, like, how do you find out how to be a hero yourself? You are measuring yourself against the ideal. Sure. 
like every ideal is, is also a judge. So you look at the ideal, you try to become like the ideal, you fail, and then society evolves to the next step through a generation that, that, that does that. So after the Christ myth, what happened in Christianity after Christ, Christ died? We had a lot of super realistic stories about people being like heroic in the least heroic way. So they were like fleeing from like the Romans. They were hiding. They're like, like some of them made sacrifices, but not in any like super important ways. And that's basically like the, the Oliver Twist story that comes after like when, when society has stabilized and understood understood the new paradigm which has been ushered in. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good session. What do you think, Andrew? Awesome. Yeah, I'd like to do this again. It was great. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> we, we're ending up with, you know, in mythology, we began with emergence and yeah, I went in all kinds of directions. Mm. Yeah, I'm it's telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, he can, he can sort of relax. He can develop his philosophy. I'm sure he's going to write much earlier than I did. But I started doing music professionally when I was 23. And yeah. I started writing philosophy when I was 39. And I've written with John Siddick. He's working on my sixth book at the moment. And because our lives don't last until we're 45 any longer, we'll live until we're at least 90 years old these days, unless we get the corona before that. The, the, he has plenty of time to write, but I'm really looking forward to read books from Erlang eventually. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, I have to, uh, well, I'd be interested in hearing your art as well, what you do before you write the books, you know, the music and the. Oh, I'm very grateful. Plays. Thanks. Yeah, all you guys out there, check out Alexander Brad Allen's music. Just just Google it and maybe you can ask Alan to get it accessible as well because it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it's sort of, yeah, it's, it's fantastic film music to begin with. It's very talented. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great. Yep.